Well, hey, good morning, Masters University. Uh, I agree with Josh, this is a bit of a weird format, but we all understand this is part of our near-term nor normal. Um, hopefully this will be helpful um, as we begin this week. Just a couple of comments regarding this week that we're in. Just a reminder, we're in operation finish, which means we want to finish the semester in person, uh, doing less of this than more of it in terms of Zooming. We are hopeful to gather next week in chapel. Uh, but we're trying to get our arms around the couple of cases that we have and the extent of uh, exposure that we're dealing with. So if I was going to pick another word besides Operation Finish, get through the end of the semester in the next four weeks, it would be Operation Common Sense. Just use good judgment, please. Uh, distancing, uh, masking, cleaning, um, screening, do the things that you know to do so that we can finish well. And I know it's uncomfortable. I know it limits some of the things we'd like to do. I know it's windy outside today, so it's not always easy to gather outside, uh, but really need you to buckle down and do the best you can, fulfilling all of the protocols that we have in place so that we can finish the semester. So that's my encouragement to you, and I'm grateful in advance for your uh, partnership in that. All right, I want to invite you to... Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 today, uh, if I were going to entitle this, it would be the priority of purity. Um, in a world where you don't hear a promotion of personal purity, certainly sexual purity, it's my desire today and uh, Dr. Horns and Johnny's uh, at the end of the week to elevate a priority that is certainly not a cultural priority, and sadly, it's often not a Christian priority, but it is a divine priority. And my purpose today is to uh, really expose you to a couple of big ideas. Number one, the value of pure purity as seen through God's word and the word consequences. The recognition of real consequences because purity matters to God and impurity damages and destroys and distances and denies you what a child of God can enjoy related to God. Listen, 80 plus percent Recent surveys, 80 plus percent in your age group are involved immorally, sexually immoral by the age of 20. And as it relates to the challenges of our culture, it's the inundation of day after day drumbeats promoting behavior that is anti Christian and anti God. Listen, here's a reminder purity matters to God. Think of the Old Testament. High priest could not go into the Holy of Holies unless a sacrifice had been offered. Uh, he had gone through the ceremonial washings because any impurity resulted in catastrophic consequences. There were sacrifices necessary to gain access to God, Old Testament. New Testament and the passages we're about to look at today are reminders of the importance of understanding the power and need of personal purity, especially as it relates to sexual purity. 81% of unmarried males, 67% of unmarried females by the age of 20 will involve themselves in sexual intimacy outside of marriage. And I want to begin with this statement. This comes out of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, as it relates to consequences, which is the first focal point of my message. And then we're going to look at choices, practical choices, recognition of real consequences, and then practical choices. Hebrews 13, 4, fornicators and adulterers. Fornicators is immor immorality outside of marriage. Adulterers, immorality inside of marriage. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. True or not true? Well, if the word of God is true, that's true. And it need to, needs to govern the way we think about how we relate to this critical topic. I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 4, if you haven't already. I want to walk you through a passage that uh, recognizes the high value of purity in the eyes of God for every believer. And I want to just highlight some consequences so that you recognize that the absence of purity has destructive and catastrophic consequence. I want you to begin, I want you to recognize, first of all, that a lack of it displeases God. Follow the passage, and I'll just read it to you and highlight some key words. We're going to be in a number of different places today. First Thessalonians chapter 4, finally then, brethren, so this is a bottom line statement, uh, Paul to the Thessalonians, 
we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk, key words, and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. So the Thessalonians are exhorted to keep doing what they're doing because what they're doing pleases the Lord. And that's the commandment that they are receiving. Verse 2, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So Paul is not just saying something apostolic in terms of authority as a spiritual leader, an appointed by God missionary and sent out one. He's reporting on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he says, this is a commandment. This comes with divine authority from the Son of God, the head of the church. Listen to these words. For you for this, rather, is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that you, each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter this sexual purity issue, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification, which is purity, God-like purity, holiness. Consequently, he who rejects this, Paul writes, is not rejecting man, but the God who gives us his Holy Spirit. Now, just a couple of highlights in this passage as it relates to consequences and why we need to pursue personal purity. We need to recognize some things. We need to recognize, first of all, that a lack of personal purity displeases God. That's what we saw in verse 1. It also dishonors God and diminishes God. Look at what it says in verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Let me tell you what sanctification means. Set apart by God for God to display God. So when you do not walk in personal purity, which is the will of God, which is the invitation of God to be like me so people can see me, when you choose to not live in a sanctified, pure, holy way as it relates to your sexual conduct, it diminishes God. It dishonors him because it misrepresents him. And furthermore, it misrepresents and dishonors, dishonors you as a Christian. Look at what it says. You, this, this is the will of God that you abstain from sexual immorality. And a word about immorality, it's pornea. It's where we get pornography, any kind of sexual impurity. It's the whole broad spectrum of impure behavior from sexual intimacy all the way to the looking and the lusting that Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 5. I want you, on the authority of Jesus Christ, to look like God and not look like the world that doesn't know God. I want you to abstain, which means don't do it at all. It's not abstain like, hey, I prefer you don't do this. Absolutely no way, no how do you do this if you're going to fulfill the will of God, properly represent God, not diminish him and not dishonor yourself and him before others. Not in lustful passion, a further descriptor, verse 5, like the Gentiles who do not know God. And at the end of verse 4, it says, let each of you know how to possess, that's control, his own vessel, his body, in sanctification and in honor, because purity equals honor as it relates to Christianity. So let me, let me put it this way. You're not going to prioritize purity until you understand that its absence, impurity, displeases God, diminishes God, dishonors him, dishonors you, because you're not walking in an honorable way. And furthermore, it results in significant defrauding and damage to those around you. I want to talk a little bit about verse, verse 6. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. Now, in the matter points you to sexual purity. Impurity defrauds. 
your brother is someone born of the same womb. So it's Christian with Christian. So it's talking about Christian conduct, pure Christian conduct, conduct in, the, in the context of Christian community and Christian relationship. And what Paul is saying is when you behave immorally, impurely, sexually impure, you're involved with a brother, someone in the same family, male to female, sister, someone related to you spiritually, and you're taking something from them. The word defraud means to take what doesn't belong to you or give what does not belong to you to give. When you defraud somebody, you're saying, I can sell you this car. It's not my car. Like if I were to go out and sell Johnny's car today, I would be defrauding him by giving something that's not mine to give or to sell something not mine to sell. And I would be defrauding the buyer by giving them something that wasn't mine to give. And they would be taking something that's not theirs to take because it doesn't belong to me and I'm giving it away or selling it. That's defrauding. Taking something that doesn't belong to you and giving something that doesn't belong to you to give. Let me explain that. As a Christian, if I'm a man, I can't take from a woman what belongs to her husband. And I can't give to some woman what does not belong to me to give, but rather belongs to my future wife. I defraud when I give what's not mine to give which is what belongs to my future wife. I'm talking about an unmarried, single, Christian adult. You defraud when you give something that belongs to your future spouse, which is your purity and your intimacy. And you allow them to experience something that belongs to somebody else, and you take from someone what belongs to their future spouse. So as a man, single man, as a Christian, when I involve myself in sexual immorality, I take what belongs to some woman's husband, future husband, and I give to that woman something that belongs to my future wife, which is the idea of verse 6, let no man transgress, violate the will and the ways of God by defrauding someone in his Christian family in the matter, and then furthermore, the Lord says, the Bible says, according to Paul, the Lord is the avenger in all these things, which means there are divine consequences. Remember, God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. The bottom line is, God says the consequences to immoral behavior is loss, damage, and destruction. And then he reminds us in verse 7, God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. If you reject this, you're not rejecting me today. You're rejecting God who gives the Holy Spirit to you. So do you feel the weight of the priority of purity? This is God's will. This is what I want. I don't want you to live like the world that doesn't know God. I don't want you to live as if you're a reflection of the culture. I want you to reveal me. I want you to live like me. I want you to live for me so that the world can see me. Personal purity is a priority because it damages people and it damages God, and ultimately it damages us. Let me uh, invite you back to Proverbs chapter 5 and this whole spirit of damage and destruction and consequences, and I think it's important because this is my, my opinion. I've been involved in ministry a long time. It seems that we do not own and accept or recognize, really recognize, the reality of consequences to moral impurity. And I want you to hear these words, and I want to ask you this question. Is this exaggerated for the sake of emphasis, hyperbole, or is this the revelation of reality? In other words, is the Bible saying this is the way it is, or is this an over-exaggeration, an overstated exaggeration for emphasis? I'm going to argue it's the revelation of reality, and I just want to highlight some words as we begin with the big idea of consequences, because personal purity, at least as it relates to the Bible, needs to recognize consequences and impact and damage, because in our culture, nobody's talking about the consequences of impurity. 
chapter 5, the book of Proverbs, and just going to highlight some things as a reminder to you. You can meditate and spend time on this at some other time during the day or the week. It would be a valuable study. This is Solomon to his son. My son, verse 1, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion. Your lips may reserve knowledge. Okay, so I want you to get wisdom. I want you to get it, own it, so you can be benefited by it. Wisdom is God's perspective on reality. Verse 3, here's the wisdom insight. For the lips of an adulteress, okay, some of the, some of the old translations will say strange woman. Strange means foreign. Not strange like weird, but foreign, not a part of God's covenant people, a culture that is pagan. So the lips of a pagan, culturally immoral woman, a woman of the world is a way you could say it. The lips of a woman of the world drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. She is very persuasive. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood which is a very uh, poisonous as well as uh, toxic uh, kind of uh, herb, sharp as a two-edged sword, meaning it's deadly. That's the idea of toxic. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable, and she does not know it. Bottom line, here's what wisdom says. Stay away from a culturally immoral woman, a woman who does not have a priority on personal purity. And I would say to you, young ladies, stay away from a man who does not have a commitment to personal purity, living as an worldly man outside of the people of God and the covenant of God's people, because the net outcome of engaging with them in immoral ways is deadly. It catastrophically damages and destroys. Verse 7, now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. Avoid at all costs. Stay as far as you can. Not get as close as you can to the immoral, impure person, male or female. It's using a female here by way of illustration because Solomon is talking to his son. And he's saying, stay away. Don't go anywhere near it. Look at verse 9, the beginning of a grocery list of consequences, motivations for his son to employ this wisdom. Verse 9, lest you give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. That's a reference to physical consequences, loss. Verse 10, lest strangers be filled with your strength and your hard-earned goods go to the house of an alien. That's material loss. Verse 11, and you groan at your latter end, and your flesh and your body are consumed. Groan is emotional loss. Verse 12, and you say, how I have hated instruction, and my heart spurned reproof. So my willful rejection of the instruction of the words of God from the people of God has resulted in great regret, emotional loss, physical loss, material loss. Look at verse 13. And I have not listened to the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to my instructors. Now listen, some of you listening today are going to do just that. This is just going to be a chapel message. You hear it, you may pay attention to part of it, but you're not buying it. You're rejecting like this writer's reject. I'm not listening to the voice of my teachers. My ear is not open or inclined to their instruction. The net effect, verse 14, I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. Let me tell you what that means. I was so calloused by the constant call on my life that I didn't listen, and it resulted in public exposure in the congregation of God's people, which is one of the consequences, humiliation. And then he says, I'm almost in utter ruin. I'm at the the very end. I hardly have anything left. All as a consequence of not avoiding the woman with the smooth lips, the, 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 the gal or the guy that seduces with words and by their behavior. And listen, you're living in a world 
that denies the damage and the disconnection that comes as a consequence of moral impurity. Well, here's another consequence to moral impurity. It disconnects you from God. It denies you the experience of life that's truly life. Blessed are the pure in heart, Matthew 5, for they shall see God. The consequence of impurity is you don't get to see God. You don't get to experience God. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, without sanctification, holiness, personal purity, no man shall see the Lord. There is a numbing, disconnecting spiritual reality when you play in the categories of impurity. If you're going to behave impurely in your mind, watching things you shouldn't watch or doing things that you shouldn't do, you deny yourself the treasure of intimacy with God and ultimately damage the things that God has designed in you by way of creation to give you an opportunity to be intimate with another human being. I tell anybody who will listen to me, if you can relate to this, the young men that will listen to me is, is, listen, God gives you a Ferrari at birth. He gives you a highly engineered tool by which you can experience life at its best as it relates to high-performance living, as if, if you're a car person or you love that kind of thing. And what happens to guys is they take that high-performance Ferrari, and instead of saving it for the racetrack, the roads that will optimize that highly tuned, specially designed tool. They take that Ferrari and they drive it through muddy roads, open fields. They they four-wheel with it instead of saving it for what it was designed for. And when you engage in sexual immorality, you take something highly tuned by God to be shared with someone that you are in a covenant relationship called marriage one person for one person for life, and you damage it by taking it in places it was, de- not, was not designed to go. And what you don't see on any movie today or any secular song today that highlights a kind of love that's not pure but unholy, what you don't hear or don't witness is the catastrophic disconnection and damage that comes personally through violating God's clear will in this category of personal purity. I've been a pastor a long time. I've been engaged with lots of people over lots of years. I can tell you for sure, for certain, that the impact of not preserving your personal purity and exchanging it for fleeting pleasure, being seduced by the ways of the world, has lifelong consequences. And absent the intervening grace of God that enables the restoration to occur, the Ferrari to go back to the engineer and the the manufacturer and have it rebuilt and retooled, which can take time and, and expense, there is a loss that is impossible to measure. So I want to begin today by calling you to recognize real consequences. Those are real consequences. Those are not fabricated. Those are not consequences that are made up. They're not instant always. That's part of the problem with consequences. You violate certain commandments and uh, directives of God, and the result is not instantaneous. So there's a, an assumption, well, you will not die. There's, these consequences are not real. And what the Bible is Providing you is a divine perspective meant to calibrate the way you think and to, listen, to prioritize what the world does not prioritize, what matters to God, and ultimately, if you believe these things are true, will matter to you. It'll preserve, it'll protect, it'll help you so that you can experience God and that so you can experience and enjoy intimacy, not just with Him, but the person he's created you to share life with. Personal purity matters. And in our culture, nothing will reinforce that except the words of God and the people of God. Turn over to chapter 7, and let's turn a corner in the time that I have remaining with you and move from real consequences to practical resolutions, real choices. 
I'm going to call this practical resolutions for those who do prioritize and do pursue purity. So we talked about real consequences, why you should. Now we're going to talk about practical resolutions, practices, decisions you make. Because the key to sexual purity is resolutions you make in advance according to the Word of God that will protect you from the encounters that can be catastrophic. Proverbs chapter 7 is one of my favorite practical passages in the Bible as it relates to personal purity. It's like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It is vivid and clear. The purpose of chapter 7 is for a son to understand the path to impurity. What are the steps? What are the choices that a person makes? Because I don't think anybody just sets out to endure catastrophic loss related to impure choices. So this is a wise father talking to a son in order to help the son understand the preventative and then the path that leads to moral failure. And I want to draw out some resolutions, some practical decisions, choices that you can make that will preserve and promote personal purity in your life. The first five verses involve the first choice, and I want to share it with you this way. A person who resolves to be pure says this, I will not neglect the Word of God. That's a resolution. It's a choice. I will not neglect the Word of God. I will daily value it, and I will engage my life with it. I find it very interesting. The first five verses all involve the words of God, translated or transferred by parents to the son. Listen to the words. My son Keep my words, treasure my commandments within you. Verse 20 of chapter 6, my son, observe the commandment of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. This has to do with parents transferring to their children the words given to them by God according to the law of God. So parents were entrusted with the law of God and to give it to their children. So when Solomon says to the son, keep my words, he's talking about keeping the words that I'm giving to you that God has given to me. Treasure my commandments within you. I'm giving you commandments that have been commands given to me. And I want you to do something with them. I want you to keep them. I want you to treasure them within you. That means store them inside. You neglect the word of God when you don't memorize the word of God. And Solomon is saying, I want you to memorize it. I want you to store it like food that you need later, like like resource that you'll need. You don't know when, but you'll have it when you need it. Store it, verse 2. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching is the apple of your eye. Keep my commandments is not talking about now storing it or treasuring it, but actually applying it. So it's, it's not just knowing the Word of God, it's doing the Word of God and treating it as the apple of your eye. It's a Hebrew idiom. Apple of your eye means you value something and treat it as precious. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, God said of Israel, you're the apple of my eye. Like a mother hen cares for her chicks, you're the focus of my attention. You are precious to me and I will treat you precious. What Solomon's saying to his son, I want you to treat the Word of God like a priority. I want you to apply it. I want you to prioritize it. I want it to be something central to your life, not peripheral. The Word of God is something I do once in a while. No, my life revolves around it. The Word of God, verse 3, bind them on your fingers, these commandments. Write them on the tablet of your heart. This has to do with rehearsing it, remembering it, putting it in a place where you, you see it because we're prone to forget it. That's the idea of bind it. Put it where you can see it, like a human post-it note. Put it in a place where you're reminded of what God's Word says. The Word of God is in front of you. You're rehearsing it. You're prioritizing it. You're applying it. You're memorizing it. Verse 4, you're building a relationship with it. Say to wisdom, you're my sister. Call understanding your intimate friend. This just has to do with familiarity. It's like the Word of God is my, my friend my family member. I spend so much time with this, is what the writer is saying, 
that it become, I have a relationship with this, a special relationship with this. Some of us know more about how our computer works than we know about how the Word of God works. We're better at PlayStation than we are managing and understanding the Scriptures. And what Solomon is saying to his son, I want you to own, understand, and become intimate with, like a sister or a special friend, these words of mine. I want you to watch verse 5, that they, they, the words that you memorize, the words that you apply, the words that you prioritize, the words that you rehearse, the words that you build a special relationship, that they may keep you from an adulteress, from a culturally immoral person, from the foreigner, the stranger, who flatters with her words. All right, here is the first big idea and resolution. The word of God is the antidote to sexual immorality. Because this statement says, when the Word of God is governing you, when the Word of God is central to you, it does things for you that prevent and protect immoral choices. From a person who's pursuing you to a world that is seducing you, you have the power and the ability to be protected and pure in an impure world. Now, how does the Word of God do that? Well, number one, the Word of God warns. Psalm 19 says, the righteous man receives benefit from the words of God because they warn him. Secondly, they satisfy him like, like precious honey, sweet honey. The words of God are a satisfying, you talk about soul food. Soul food is not Southern cooking. Soul food is biblical truth that serves and satisfies the soul. They, that's why uh, Job said, I desire your word more than my necessary food. That's why Jesus said in John 4, I have food to eat that you don't know of, which is to do the will of God, to know the will of God. It is soul satisfying. Let me say, I think one of the most important and helpful things I've ever learned as a Christian desiring to be honorable to the Lord in this way. Hungry people eat. The reason we get in trouble morally is because we're not satisfied spiritually. The reason we get in trouble morally is because we're not satisfied spiritually. We haven't feasted on the Word of God that is more precious than gold. We've not fed on the sweet words of the Scripture. Remember David in Psalm 63, he's running from Absalom. He's in trouble. He's in a cave. He's in the wilderness. And he says, my soul is satisfied as with the richest of food. He says, marrow and fatness, which is like steak and lobster tail. My soul has eaten a, a significant and satisfying spiritual dinner when I meditated on thee, O God, in the night watches, when I reflected on your words, when I reflected on your person, it was soul satisfying. Here's the first resolution. Don't neglect the Word of God. Said in a positive way, I will not neglect the Word of God. It'll be central to me. It'll be a priority to me. I will feast on it. I will find benefit from it. It sanctifies, washed by the water of the Word. It cleanses my soul. It's like taking a spiritual bath. It's like eating a spiritual dinner. It warns me. It sanctifies me. It satisfies me. Now listen, there's no chance that you're going to be hungry and not eat. And there's no chance you can be satisfied without the Word of God being the satisfaction. No woman, no man, no exchange physically, emotionally, can do what the Word of God does when it comes to soul satisfaction. Let me give you one proverb I really like. Proverbs 27, verse 7. The wise man says, a sated man loathes honey. Now, sated means saturated. I mean, he can't eat another bite. A sated man is the man or girl you are when you leave the Thanksgiving table. You are filled up. You can't eat another bite. A sated man loathes honey. Honey, by way of figure, by way of symbol, is put for the richest of food. 
A sated man loathes. It's repulsive to him even to eat honey. Why? Not because the honey's not tasty, but because he's so satiated. He's so satisfied. He's so filled up. He couldn't eat another mite. He's maxed out. Now watch the rest of the verse, verse 7. But to a famished man, any bitter thing is sweet. So filled up, I don't care if it's really desirable, not interested. It's repulsive to me. Not filled up, famished, hungry, any bitter thing is sweet. When I'm hungry, even good stuff looks, at, even not so good stuff rather, looks attractive to me. It's like going to the grocery store after Thanksgiving meal, you've got a will of steel. You go to the grocery store before a meal, and even the rice cakes look good because hungry people have an attraction to things that aren't satisfying simply because they feel famished. Immoral people are like that. They're hungry. An interesting insight in Hebrews chapter 12 talks of Esau. The writer of Hebrews says, let there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. I think that is a classic graphic illustration of the heart of immorality and godless behavior. Esau in Genesis 25 was so hungry, he said, if I don't eat this food, I'm going to die. And what good is my birthright if I don't eat? That's kind of how it works with immorality. You get so hungry for a relationship and intimacy and connection, you go, what good is the future? I need to take advantage of right now. I can't live without this. I am humanly hungry to the point I'm, I'm willing to eat something bitter that will be toxic like wormwood instead of satisfying like honey. That's the idea. Hungry people eat. Let me give you a second resolution for those who prioritize personal purity. Go back to Proverbs chapter 7. As the father talks to the son, he gives him some other challenging perspectives that come out of a personal illustration. He's now going to give a description of a young man who he has observed, and this is a figure, this is a morality play. Solomon is giving his son perspective on why bad things happen to good people who want to be pure. This is the choices they make and I'm going to give you the resolutions they need to make. So let me give you the second resolution, choice you need to make. Number one, I will not neglect the Word of God. Number two, I will learn lessons from life. I will learn lessons from life. Verse six, for at the window of my house. Now who's talking? The wise father. And he's saying from the window of his house, he says he looked out through the lattice, verse 7, and he saw. Now, I just want to stop right there. Let me tell you what wisdom does. It learns lessons from life by making observations in life, by watching others, learning lessons from their choices. A wise person learns lessons from life. They look at people, they look at reality, and they go, you know what? That path, it's not a productive path. Now, here's something that young people need a heavy dose of. Observation that produces an awareness of the reality of impurity. And again, I said it earlier, the media does not reveal the heart-wrenching loss that comes to those who participate in immoral behavior. They never talk about the disconnection and the, the challenges, future tense, of what occurs when you enter into intimacy outside of marriage. They don't talk about the memories that are hard to get over. They don't talk about the callous soul. If you're somebody's engaged in graphic online pornography, there's a numbing effect to that that can damage you for an extended period of time. Who talks about that? You're not going to watch a television program that's going to promote the idea that there's severe loss or even play out for you the catastrophic loss when you make a promise to your future wife or husband and break that promise. They don't play out 
the losses that attend to it. And what Solomon is saying to his son that wisdom does, it looks out and it says, you know what? I see that. I look at what happens and I learn from what happens. So I don't have to live out what has happened, that I don't have to, to endure the loss that that person endured. Learn lessons from life. You all have friends. You all have family. You all are witness to choices people make that have consequences that should inform your choices because you look and you learn. Naive people, immature people, unwise people are people who do not look and learn. It's like they can look at something and assume, ah, that can happen to them, but it won't happen to me. I can enter into this situation, and it won't have the same consequences to me that it had with them. I, I, she won't get pregnant. I won't go through these challenges. It won't work itself out. Wisdom says, this is the way it is. Learn from what you see in the lives of people. Third choice to make. Third resolution to prioritize personal purity. Make this decision. I will choose or decide in advance. I will choose in advance what? What I will do and what I won't do. Verse 7 is instructive because it says this. This is what the wise man saw. I saw among the naive. The word naive, some of your Bibles will say simple. Some of your Bibles will say immature. The Hebrew word means open door. I saw among the young men someone who's morally an open door. I discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense. The word sense is the Hebrew word for heart, like the moral compass. So this is what I saw, says Solomon. I saw somebody who's like an open door. They, they, they are open-minded. They, they haven't made up their mind. And they don't have any moral compass. They lack sense, moral sense. So a simple man in the book of Proverbs is not somebody who's dumb, has nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with moral maturity. A person who gets in trouble, which is what this is about, is a person who's naive. They're open-minded. They haven't chosen in advance what they will do and not do. They haven't closed the door on certain choices. And they've got no clarity as it relates. They lack sense, their moral compass. Here's a choice you need to make. You need to decide in advance so you're not naive, so you're not open-minded to choices that could be catastrophic. You need to decide in advance what you will do and not do, where you will go, where you won't go in advance. You establish that before those convictions are needed and challenged. You don't make up your mind in the moment. That's what this guy does. You make up your mind ahead of time. The morally immature are situational ethicists. That means they make up their mind as they go, not as they should. A morally immature person is an open-minded to the choice at the time when you need to make up your mind ahead of time. So let me put it plainly. If you want to prioritize moral purity, you got to make some decisions. There's certain things I am not going to do. I'm not going to go certain places after dark. I'm not going to stay out late when things happen that could be tempting to me. I'm not going to put myself in circumstances one-on-one -on -one with someone. I'm not going to go to the apartment when there's nobody home. I'm going to put things in my life that protect me from those choices. I decide ahead of time. I am not going into the room and fire up the computer when there's nobody there, when there's no accountability. I'm going to decide ahead of time so that I'm not morally immature and I'm not lacking sense morally. Fourth, verse 8, I saw among the naive, I discerned among the youths, a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner. Now, the her corner is referring to the immoral woman. Passing through the street near her corner, he takes the way to her house. Here's a fourth 
priority, a resolution, a choice you make. I will not flirt with fire. Now, it couldn't be any plainer. This young man is passing through the street near her corner. He takes the way to her house. Now, if you read through this chapter, he doesn't make up his mind until verse 22. Up until now, he's just cruising. He's not got a clear moral compass. He hasn't made decisions and choices ahead of time, and he's putting himself in harm's way. Notice what it says in verse 8 of chapter 5. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Wise people do not put themselves in vulnerable places with vulnerable people. You choose ahead of time to stay out of harm's way. You don't flirt with fire. You have convictions that you make ahead of time, and you make choices to not put yourself in places that can get you in trouble. You make resolutions like Daniel did. He made up his mind that he would not defile himself, in that case with the king's food. So you, you have convictions. Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes, uh, Job 31, 1, that I won't look on a woman in an inappropriate way. I won't gaze and long for and lust after a virgin. I'm not going to do that. And secondly, I'm not going to put myself in positions that promote that. Listen, one of the things that leads to impurity is foolishness and flirting with fire, putting yourself in harm's way. I have a personal friend and who was traveling to Europe on a missions trip, and he was delayed in Amsterdam. His plane was broken down, and they were attempting to repair it before he moved on to the trip he was taking to Central Europe. And he was given time to get off the plane, and he decided he would take a tour of Amsterdam in the eight hours that he had before the flight was designated to to be repaired and and uh, take off. And so he walked through the streets of of uh, Amsterdam. And if anybody, if you, you may or may not know, but Amsterdam is known as the pornography prostitution capital of the world. That's where the red light district, uh, that was, those terms came into being. And there's sections of Amsterdam where you guys, people window shop for people, women. And so my friend, out of curiosity, decided to see if what he had heard was so. And he ended up making choices that day that dramatically changed his life. He made a choice morally that nearly destroyed his marriage, eliminated him from his position in ministry, and damaged for an extended period of time his relationship with his children, all because he took a walk through the part of a city that he shouldn't have been in by himself. He shouldn't have been in even if he had someone with him. That's the idea. This young man gets in trouble because he puts himself in places that are catastrophic in terms of potential loss and vulnerability. Verse 9, let me give you a fifth priority that you need to resolve to make a choice as a young person, as a Christian who wants to value purity for God's sake, for your future spouse's sake, for your reputation and ministry's sake, so that you can enjoy God, here's another choice you need to make. I will stay in the light. Notice what it says, verse 9, in the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. So he goes by her house, flirting with fire, and he goes at the darkest parts of the night. It's interesting, twilight, getting dark, evening, dark, pupil or middle of the night, deep darkness. The idea here is he is seeking out something at a time, listen, where there's no accountability. It's like Job 24, the eye of the adulterer waits until dusk, thinking no one will see me. One of the deceptions of immorality is nobody will know. What fuels his foolishness is not just that he hasn't made up his mind and not just that he put himself in harm's way, but he's under the deception that no one will know. It's dark. No one can see me. I'm isolated. I'm alone. And there are, therefore, no consequences. Here's a decision you need to make. Number one, you need to recognize that God always sees. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21 says, the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all of his paths. So it's never too dark for God to see. And it's rarely, if ever, true that nobody else will see. 
People tend to find out when you least expect it. Be sure your sin will find you out. What you do in secret will be made public. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. There will be revelation of reality somehow, someday. You cannot hide. There are people who go online thinking they're insulated, and then somebody hacks, and it, it's revealed what's going on and the, the dialogue that has occurred. The text messages that you think are personal and private all of a sudden become public and known. The the, the apps that you use that you think insulate you from accountability or the choices you make, the idea that I'm in the dark and no one will know is, first of all, a deception. God knows, and it will be revealed. Second of all, it puts you in a vulnerable place where you become prone to making choices you wouldn't make if the lights were on. It's why you want to put yourself in positions where people can see you. Uh, if you go by my office, you'll see a big glass in my door. The big, the big pane of glass is an instrument to protect me so that I know that who's ever in the office area, they can see what's going on in my office. Part of the commitment you make is this. I am going to make myself accountable. So I can't be deceived by the idea that no one knows, because I'm going to let people know. My wife has my password to my phone and my computer. My assistant, Shana, has the same access. Why? I don't want the dark. The dark is a dangerous place morally. When I travel, whenever you're doing, you want people to know. You want to stay in the light. You want to put yourself in a position where you're safe morally. Listen to this. Accountability is the friend of integrity. Accountability is the friend of integrity. You want to be integrous? You want to remain pure? Keep yourself in a place where people can see you. Don't go into that dark place, that, that, that dark spot in the, at the beach or wherever you're headed to or the mountains all by yourself. Keep your life in the light. Make a decision. I'm going to stay in the light. I'm not going to give this an opportunity to happen. So the last thing, and this is going to read several verses, the last resolution, I'll be alert and ready. Because there's something most people don't know about impurity. It's proactive. You don't have to be looking to be, be impure. Impurity is looking for you. You don't have to be looking to be immoral. Immorality is looking for you. Verse 10, and behold, I'm going to highlight a few key words, the personification of impurity and immorality typified here by this woman. And behold, a woman, watch this, comes to meet him. She's dressed as a harlot, cunning of heart. She's boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the square. She lurks by every corner. Verse 13, key words. So she seizes him. She kisses him. With a brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I've paid my vows, which is basically she's saying I'm a religious woman, when in fact she wasn't. Therefore, watch verse 15, I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. Now here's the big idea. Immorality, typified by this woman, is aggressive, proactive, and predatory. You see that in chapter 6, where it says in verse 26, for an account of an harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Here's a newsflash. Impurity is aggressive. And people who fail morally or fail in terms of their purity do not anticipate the aggressiveness, the availability, she lurks by every corner, and the appeal of impure behavior. Notice what she said, I spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I've sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses, for the man is not home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money. In other words, it's free. There's no accountability. At full moon, he will come home with her many persuasions. She entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. She's just appealing. Food, finery, frolic, fun, free. Stay on the alert. That's how impurity is 
That's how immorality is. It's aggressive. You don't have to be looking for it. It's looking for you. You need to live like you're, you're in the Middle East, like you're in Baghdad, where it's just not safe, or Afghanistan, where there could be uh, an IUD or some sniper, any place, any time. Not to make you paranoid, but to live smart so that you can maintain purity because impurity is looking for you. Last thing, I will count on consequences. Verse 22 Suddenly he follows her. So he makes this impulsive decision. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool, until an arrow pierces through his liver, that's his, his core. And as a bird hastens to the snare, watch this, verse 23, he does not know it will cost him his life. Consequences. Consider it, count on it. You're not the exception. Verse 26, many are the victims she's cast down. Numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. Count on consequences. I will count on consequences. Not ignore them, but assume them. I won't make these choices because I know there are sure consequences coming my way. Let the word of God sensitize your conscience. Let the word of God protect you. Make choices to the end that God protects you because there are real consequences. God cannot lie, and he is not mocked. Father, I thank you this morning for the privilege of preaching. I thank you for the challenge of your word and its clarity. I thank you for the wisdom that we can gain so the, the life that we live is not littered with pain and loss. Lord, I pray for these young men and women. I pray they'd make choices today that preserve their home, their family, their future. The honor of God and the blessing that he gives, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will experience life that is truly life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.